So uh, this is our agenda for today. <clears throat> We're going to um, uh, first hear a story uh, from, um, from the Arab Spring, uh, from Matt Perkins, uh, who is with UN Esqua. And he will share with us uh, um, some insights about that experience as kind of a framing conversation for, um, for our tutorial. Uh, then you'll hear a little bit from me uh, about the social media context, sort of more writ large, uh, in terms of what we're seeing in terms of trends and, and, um, and uh, realities, practicalities. And then finally, we're going to hear from Jana Herdnova, who, uh, as many of you may know, is the first, uh, first author of a um, document that the Center for Technology and Government produced about a year ago. Gosh, that went by quickly, didn't it? Uh, entitled, uh, Eight Essential Elements of Social Media Policy um, uh, 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 for Government. So it's a very much focused on the governmental context, how government agencies can think about the creation um, of a social media policy uh, to inform decision making within, within those agencies. Our format is, as this says here, we're going to do some presentations, um, certainly, but we're also very much interested uh, in, in discussion. So we're actually going to ask you to do some small group and some large group discussion uh, over the next two hours um, so that we can hear not only from, you can hear not only from, from us, but also from each other uh, on, on some of these important um, ideas. Uh, any questions for us before we start? Comments? Okay, good. Um, so, Matt. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we'll be talking today about uh, social media and e-government applications in the ESQA region, which is uh, in the Middle East. We have uh, 13 member states going from Sudan to Turkey to Iran. So that's our geographical area. The specific focus of uh, our inquiry today is going to be looking at the implementations of social media in the region to derive from a more people-driven perspective what individuals want to see coming from their governments in terms of social media. Um, one of the problems that we have in dealing with this topic generally is that uh, data is very spotty and oftentimes distorted in uh, hidden ways. So to first understand what we do have in terms of measurements and insight, uh, we have information on telephones, uh, internet connectivity, literacy, uh, basic uh, ability to communicate numbers. We also have linguistic data that comes to us from Facebook and social media tools themselves. And we'll be looking at a series of studies that have been undertaken to dive into the social media resources online and map out how people are communicating with each other and what they want to say in the Arab world. Now, we have a couple of major blind spots that we need to illustrate before we go further. Uh, one of those major ones is YouTube. Uh, YouTube is extremely popular in the Middle Eastern region. It's one of the main drivers of content, and it's very, very difficult to measure. We get very poor statistics on who is sharing what with whom, where they are, and how that's spread. So we know we have a problem there. We typically have some large linguistic issues. There was some allusion to that in the opening session this morning, and we'll take a look at how that affects our insight. Uh, the other big one is the ripple effect. We're going to refer to this as proxy engagement. We know that in most of these countries, we're dealing with a core of people who are well-connected, and then uh, ancillary communities that are more or less marginalized. This is a very interesting case study for us, because within this small region, we have countries with comparatively low literacy rates, somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% for Egypt, uh, comparatively low IT penetration rates, 40-50% internet penetration, compared to countries just a little bit off to the side in the Gulf Coast, where we'll have literacy rates in the low 90s and communication rates that are well over 100%. <clears throat> so how those interplay uh, are key. This is a visual depiction of some of the information that was discussed this morning in the uh, opening session. Because the issues of uh, penetration were discussed very uh, well in the morning session, I'm not going to stay too long on this, but for anyone who was not able to attend that, what we have here is a more meaningful illustration of the capacity of social media tools to uh, have penetration and impact in the, uh, the host countries. Now, 
We talk a lot about the Arab Spring, and it's a convenient handle, but in some ways can be more confusing. The, the Arab Spring is often listed as, uh, as the social media uh, momentum. But in reality, when we look at the countries that are caught up in these kinds of political changes, the situations on the ground are so different, it's illusory to consider them all part of a single movement. For the purposes of our conversation today, the message of the Arab Spring that would be shared between all of the countries we're going to look at would be something more along the lines that leaders can fall, not along the lines of the impact of social media in, uh, in the, the areas in question. Now, what this slide is illustrating for us is the uh, Facebook subscriber numbers as a function of the uh, population. Now, as we see in this case, uh, Egypt is quite low, 22.61%. Uh, this is more illuminative, uh, uh, this has greater capacity to illuminate the question for us than typically some of the under, other indicators we see tossed around in terms of total Facebook subscriber numbers. Uh, for example, Egypt has one of the largest populations in the Middle East, so one would tend to expect a large number of Facebook users anyway. But as a percentage of the overall population, we can see that the percentage is quite low. One of the things that I wanted to illustrate is what we're seeing over here to the right of this graph, that we actually have quite a few countries where the percentage of Facebook use among the connected population is quite high. So when we talk about using this as a social media tool to communicate with the people who are connected, we have a stronger capacity in the, right, the, the left side of this graph than we do on the right. Yes. Mobile connectivity. We have uh, quite a few cases uh, where we have people who are using, uh, uh, we end up with more Facebook users than we have internet penetration because the people are using Facebook on mobile devices that are not counted within the baseline connectivity statistics for the country. Accounts. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, another footnote that would be well considered in this data, is it's certainly not unheard of for people to have more than one Facebook account. In fact, in certain demographics, people often have two or more. <coughs> Any other questions? The issue of linguistics was raised in this morning's session, and it's a very good uh, probative question for understanding impact in these areas. Uh, this graph illustrates uh, the distribution of uh, language settings among the Arab region countries. Now, some of this data uh, is pretty consistent with expectations. Uh, when we look at the Egyptian case, for example, we see a pretty reasonable balance between Arabic and English. Uh, but this, again, is illustrative of the market that this tool is reaching tends to be more literate in English than uh, the population as a whole. Uh, particularly when we look at cases, for example, <coughs> of Somalia and the United Arab Emirates. We might have a very well-connected uh, population with very high Facebook use, uh, but it's extremely unlikely that uh, native Emiratis are choosing to use English on Facebook 85% of the time. These numbers are more suggestive that these uh, Facebook subscribers are uh, expatriate uh, employed uh, migrant workers in these areas. Uh, particularly one that stood out to me in this regard uh, was Yemen. And that will be a, an interesting case as we, as we look further into the data. One component that has remained uh, sadly under-discussed in our analysis so far is the capacity for social media to solve some of the gender empowerment problems that we have, particularly in developing countries. The Middle East is no exception in this regard. Uh, there's a wide diversity of uh, levels of penetration in Facebook usage, um, and we'll need to sort of tuck this slide into the back of our minds as we start looking at some of the other social media usage patterns which follow uh, different distributions. Um, I have a lot of mixed feelings when I look at this slide, <laughs> because, <clears throat> for example, when we come back over at looking at our, our Yemeni Facebook users, which I think is a particularly interesting example of adoption of social media by the elite within the context of its capacity to influence others. 
With only 21% of your many Facebook users being female, that's a very depressing number. However, I would advocate a, a more optimistic interpretation of this. If we were actually to establish an e-government empowerment program and attempt to set uh, empowerment of women as a key deliverable, a 21% impact weight rate would be really good. So when we consider the capacity of this tool as it exists to reach a marginalized population, that's very good news. Uh, obviously, we'd like to see that shift quite a bit, uh, but as a place to start, there's, uh, there's certainly some room for hope in that regard. Uh, Lebanon, Bahrain, and Jordan, I like to point those out as being comparatively better balanced. This is my effort to win most confusing infographic of the session award. <laughs> It's, uh, it's very information rich, uh, and I enjoy it quite a bit, but it does bear some explanation, which is the, the sign of a bad graphic. This is uh, uh, derived from a data set that was put together the, by the uh, Berkman Institute at Harvard University uh, from a publication that they did uh, called Mapping the Arabic Blogosphere. There's an intriguing amount of data that comes out of this. Uh, the images you see here, the size of the dot is derived by the number of other blogs which link to it, uh, implying the impact and importance of that particular property. They're grouped uh, by uh, interlinking to one another and uh, color-coded by topic. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out here uh, is that in support of what uh, Thad Hall was saying this morning on the capacity of activist groups in the Middle East to effectively use social media to mobilize constituencies and push for change, we see a representation of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood that is significantly higher than any other detectable uh, special interest advocacy group in the Arabic blogosphere and significantly stronger than uh, pro-Islam categorized blogs in general. That being said, <clears throat> it's interesting to view this part of social media usage, being blogging, uh, within the comparison to what we were seeing out of Facebook. Uh, in this case, we see uh, the capacity to have outreach and impact transcending some of those national borders. These charts don't line up very well. When we look at the percentage of, uh, of uh, penetration that we have in Egypt, uh, compared to their representation in the blogosphere, we see that they're, they follow a very different pattern. This is uh, a listing of the top visited websites from persons uh, surfing from Egypt. Uh, it was derived from alexa.com for uh, the month of August. One of the things that uh, bears consideration here when we talk about uh, using ICT for e-government outreach and these sorts of e-democracy uh, e and e-governance programs is to consider that we may have uh, penetration rates which appear low, but the popularity of the tools themselves belie the amount of influence that those tools have in reaching their constituencies. If we look at this from a perspective as a government who's wanting to promote messages, services, uh, philosophies to users, this shows us where the people are and what the people are doing. I think it's interesting to compare that by contrast to some of the social media adoption rates we've seen in the West, where blogging has been on decline, particularly in younger demographics in the last couple of years, that isn't holding true for the Middle East. We're seeing more uh, perpetuation of blogging as a uh, means of idea expression than we have in other cases. So I wanted to illustrate that. Here again, we have our YouTube problem highlighted. It was just the issue of uh, mobile phone video and the impact that that's having on mobilizing political change. The communication of people in their uh, home environments is again emphasized by this case. When these, uh, the blogs that resulted in the infographic we saw earlier were analyzed, the most frequent outgoing link was to YouTube clips. And we see the, the ranking of the remainder. This helps us understand what people are talking about and how they're talking about it with each other. When bloggers in the Arab region talk about politics, this is how it tends to play out in the uh, blogging social media phase. One of the things that stood out interestingly here was that domestic political for reform as a topic of conversation uh, at 17.5%. 
If you're a government that wants to reach out through e-democracy and have a bi-directional dialogue with the people, this is an excellent way to be able to facilitate communication with what people are talking about and how they want to see that pursued. Um, it also reminds me of the uh, adage in American politics to never screw up on a slow news day, uh, <laughs> with domestic news being one of the highest uh, topics of conversation. This is a breakdown of the political themes discussed by bloggers in the uh, Middle Eastern area. Uh, there are several uh, interesting lessons that can be learned from this. But I wanted to highlight uh, the areas of supporting and criticizing domestic leaders. Uh, there's a lot of engagement on these topics and in ways that are sophisticated and idea-driven. Uh, when we see the uh, level, of, the amount of time that connected populations are spending in tools like Facebook and Blogger, and the amount of uh, political commentary that's happening through them, this helps us tap into the, uh, the wishes of the people for engagement. When we look at how the people are interfacing between social media and their, their governmental representatives, we can see three clear cohorts of, uh, of actors. The community at large, which in my case I would like to have include uh, the non-connected population, people who are advocating for specific causes, and people who are trying to have redress for specific grievances. And I'd like to show you a few examples of how that's playing out. This is a success case <clears throat> in the uh, city of Amman, Jordan. Omar Mani was the mayor of the city at that time. One of the things that uh, I'd like to point out here is that even though we have a case where Twitter adoption is, as was illustrated this morning, quite low, we see in the interaction here uh, multilinguality use. I know this was an important uh, issue to some of the, the attendees in this room. And we have a bi-directional communication that is transparent to anyone who wishes to monitor this channel to see what's being asked for and how the government is responding directly to the people. Uh, this becomes kind of a digital open door policy that anyone can audit and see what's happening. Uh, I particularly chose this example because it, uh, it amused me in light of one of our earlier sessions in which uh, our folks from the UK were talking about the platform that they had made called Fix My Street. Uh, I think what we see here in this Twitter example emphasizes two important points. If you don't have an e-government application in place, social media will become the crack that that uh, engagement flows into. This turns it into the second point, which is this release valve for social pressure and governmental interaction. There's no application that they can go to and say, on my street, there's a problem with, in this case, wild dogs at night. But they can send a message to the mayor of the city, and he will respond to them, and anyone can see what happened. Here's an another example of this case. I selected it because it helps illustrate engagement with the disaffected. In this case, uh, the Twitter message was uh, a little bit cranky. Uh, there's an overtone of... Uh, concern about uh, corruption in this case, and uh, anyone, again, can see how the, the mayor dealt with that. I wanted to illustrate this because in one of the earlier sessions today, the 12 o'clock, and in some of our uh, sessions previously, there's been a lot of conversation about trust. And particularly in the Arab region, there are uh, a lot of concerns about people trusting their relationships with government, the competence of the government. Is the government does the government want to listen to me? Are they going to do anything about it when they do? I've noticed from a lot of the folks who have been doing e-government applications in the developed world that the message has been, you have to have infrastructure first, and the e-government is only as good as the physical government, the brick and mortar government. I would like to suggest that in the developing world, we have a little bit of a different situation. Uh, even though, in, for example, the Lebanese case, there are quite a few areas of the country where they'll be quite happy to have eight hours of power supplied a day. That would be a good day. But we have internet penetration rates and uh, mobile penetration rates sufficient that people can interact and do interact quite a bit in Facebook and blogging, as we saw in the infographic earlier. So even in cases where the infrastructure is quite poor, 
interaction is still enabled. In cases where trust in government is quite low, we can use social media applications as an opportunity to have transparent accountability to the people. Why would we not want to do that? I'd like to now branch off a little bit to talk more about this trust factor. There were two uh, studies that really caught my attention, and this uh, also speaks to some of our cross-cultural blind spots that I alluded to earlier. They were done by uh, Pew, the American Center for uh, Research in uh, American Public Life. Um, in this case, they did a study in 2009 that was see seeking to address why the discussion networks in the American social sphere were shrinking. People had less friends and they talked to them less. They wanted to know what was going on with that. And so they specifically studied whether or not IT was having an impact on that. And there were some intriguing findings from that data. I would encourage anyone who's interested to review the study in a whole, but I pulled out these particular factoids to illustrate a correlation that uh, is a rich opportunity for further study. If it offers a causative effect, it'll be great. When people are using the internet and particularly social media, this correlates with different trust mechanisms. In this case, broader social networks, the probability of having a different uh, uh, a confidant who is of a different race, exposure to different ideas, and uh, in the case of uh, Facebook, higher uh, political engagement. Uh, a second study that I would cite us to by this uh, title was just released in 2011, also illustrated some intriguing findings correlated specifically to users who were more engaged on Facebook, controlling for factors such as income, education, gender, and so forth. And what we see from this is that it, all other things being equal, controlled for, Facebook use highly correlates to political activity. If this effect holds true cross-culturally, we have a unique opportunity to influence social change by engaging with social media in, in this region. A uh, final point that I'd like to pull out of this uh, is uh, this quote to uh, substantiate the political activity uh, issue. This is an example of the second cohort. We've moved now beyond the public in general to address advocacy groups. This uh, is an initiative from a very impressive young lady, Ezra Al-Shafai. She's from Bahrain and has been very successful in putting together uh, social media advocacy, group, advocacy groups for a wide variety of topics through the Middle Eastern region. Uh, and uh, has been arguably quite successful in driving for change off of those. This uh, being an example of uh, e-democracy and civic engagement in these platforms. Now, finally, I'd like to highlight the example of the petitioner, in this case on the Bahrain e-government uh, web property. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to highlight about this is that typically in uh, the social media e-government interactions we're seeing in the Middle East, Governments are still using social media as though it was another broadcast channel, a tool to inform people. Uh, it's sort of a enough about me, what do you think of me kind of idea. Uh, in this case, uh, the material being put out by the government very much falls into that grain. They're basically press releases. Uh, however, we do see more interactivity in the comments. Uh, in this particular case, a specific suggestion was made and the government came back and responded and, and took the required action, the recommended action. I'd also like to illustrate this. Uh, the e-government portal poses specific questions to the visitors, collects the data, and I thought uh, of particular note, illustrates the action that has been taken as a result of the information provided. Um, certainly a far step from e-voting, but in terms of a government consulting with and being accountable to its people, it's a great step in the right direction. <clears throat> in terms of understanding uh, the glass half full question that I raised in the meeting this morning, I think we've, we've covered the notion quite robustly that, that none of us, or at least none of us willing to speak in public, <laughs> are under the impression that these were Facebook revolutions. And it is important to understand that there are specific limitations to the social media interactions in the public sphere. However, uh, this data coming from the data set that uh, people was referring to earlier this morning from the, from the Dubai School, this is the Arabic Social Media Report, second edition, uh, 
did research on Facebook, among Facebook users in the Middle East, and when this, this represents the results of the data that they obtained there, it's very clear that among people who are using social media, they very much want their politicians to continue to engage directly with them in social media. So returning to our opening question, how do people in the Arab world want their governments to engage with them? We have three main points. Governments need to first understand the online ecosystem, how the people are talking to each other, who's driving what. In some cases, are we dealing with very low penetration where, we, where we're focusing on how am I reaching the next person, not just the person on the other end of the social media screen. And design these engagements specifically in mind for reaching those who are underserved. We had an earlier question in the conference this week on are we not talking about applications in developing worlds that are essentially already reaching the elite and the connected. Uh, this, is an, this is an important point. We've talked about the knock-on effect quite a bit, so I'll save that for now. Uh, but it should be uh, part of any active social media policy. And then the third bullet point, I would advocate that particularly in the developing world, where these social media engagement points are not displacing existing e-government applications. There aren't other ways for the people to interact with their leaders. These tools themselves can rightly be considered part of the e-government strategy. An active uh, campaign to engage proactively on Facebook, uh, engaging with uh, influential members of the blogging community to drive policy and uh, show accountability and communication are excellent opportunities for uh, these e-government engagement policies. Thank you. Uh, on, uh, on approval from Teresa, we'll go ahead and open, <laughs> open the program to uh, direct questions on this presentation at this point, and then we'll get going with the rest later on. Please. Thanks. Could you make some comments about the difference or relationship or impact of social media relationships between people within a country and those in country and out of country, and particularly in the context of the Arab Spring? I mean, there was, there was a statistic that I've, I've seen that 50 percent of the tweets in the Arab Spring basically were in English because of an engagement of, a, of a, the global audience. Absolutely, yeah, that's a great point. I'm, I'm trying to madly click my back button to get back to the, the infographic of doom. Maybe that's a fool's errand. Um, Twitter is a really interesting case. I, and not to, not to be too academic about it, but going back to the de defining the terms, I think uh, there's a tendency to view the Egyptian revolution as the Arab Spring. And certainly the fall of Mubarak was sort of a, a keynote event in that process. Um, but I think we need to understand the, have the notion of the Arab Spring be broader than that. You know, in that case, there was a lot of Twitter engagement in English. Uh, citing the, uh, the Arab Social Media Report uh, volume as well, they did some really intriguing research going back and mapping calls for action, specific calls for action and demonstration, both on Facebook and Twitter, with the resulting action which occurred to show whether or not there was any correlation in these tools driving activity. Uh, particularly in the case of Twitter, uh, the correlation is pretty slim. Um, I would advocate that that was, in, in the, particularly in the Egyptian case, more of a taking the local events to the international stage than it was for the coordination of events within the country. Uh, data that I think would back that up very well is that it's important for us to keep in mind that for an entire week during the Egyptian revolution, the internet was completely non-functional in the country. And this didn't correlate at all to the number of people that were going out in the street. Now, I would supplement what Thad said earlier about the social media use by the Muslim Brotherhood to promote uh, political change. You know, when the Mubarak regime made the decision to pull the plug on communications, this had a, an encircling effect around the middle class that was watching the revolution play out at home, and they felt this as the regime defining them as part of the revolution because they were now affected. The government cut off my phone. You know, I'm, I'm part of this too. 
So I think in many cases, the absence of ICTs in a broader scale had much more to do with getting people in the streets in the, in the Egyptian context than anything else. As a counterpoint to that, I think some of the things we're seeing in uh, political changes that are currently happening in the Arab world, the engagement between what's happening on the ground and what the international community is paying attention to has been absolutely vital when we look at cases like Yemen and Syria and how the international diplomacy is coming in and what's going in and out of the country um, is a really key point. And I think in those cases, SMS in particular, cell phone video, is having much more of an impact. Um, and to the degree that we can conflate SMS and Twitter as a communication platform, I think that would be a, an easier sell. Silver from Estonia. Um, I have two questions. First, uh, sure. you presented a survey that was saying something like people using Facebook daily or twice a daily are more likely to say yes to the mm -hmm. question that most people can be trusted. Yes. Uh, have you ever thought about the possibility that um, that is vice versa, that these people who trust people are more ready to use Facebook? Book put up their picture of their children and, and, and talk about mm -hmm. the things. So it's, it's not the um, um, result, but the, but the um, starting point, that you, when you start to use Facebook, you have to trust people. And the second question is about, um, um, about the research about uh, the Facebook. Uh, how, how many people use Facebook? I just check, checked the statistics. And I have to say that uh, just in, in, in recent two or, or three months, China just passed Estonia, where uh, there are 500, more than 500,000 Facebook us users in China and only 400,000 in Estonia. Although uh, in China it's 0.04% and in Estonia it's 33% of the population using Facebook. And my question is, is there any research that will also look to other social network uh, tools than Facebook, but are local, like in China we have Ren Ren, for example, and then we can really say how many people are connected uh, via social network. Thank you. Okay, sure. Now I'll go ahead and take those and then we'll get over to the left half of the room. <laughs> uh, so your first point on is, is Facebook causational? Uh, I was trying to be deliberate in my wording uh, on that this is a correlation. Uh, you know, as an IT guy, I would love the notion that an IT tool is driving humans to behave differently. Uh, that's a pretty hard sell. <laughs> that, that, that's very rarely true. However, uh, when we're looking at markets particularly like the United States, which does have a comparatively very large percentage of the population on Facebook, I would hypothesize that it probably isn't exclusively an effect of trusting people gravitate towards Facebook. If that's the case, we had an enormous amount of very trusting people lying around the room in the United States just waiting to coalesce. I, I would kind of guess that's not so much the case. Um, in the, some of the other tools that were looked at in the Pew research, there were MySpace, image sharing, and blogging. Um, there were some very intriguing differences in how trusting people are depending on which tool they tend to use most. Um, one of the things that's really interesting to me is that when you break down issues of privacy and trust online and then sort them by generational cohort, younger people care a lot less about privacy issues than older people online. Why that is is a fascinating question, but I would hypothesize that as people use tools that make it easier to connect with other people, they, became, they become less uh, concerned about doing so, and that uh, enables them to make these kinds of connections more freely. And I think in laying, you know, we talk a lot about is the Middle East ready for democracy? Is XYZ developing country ready for democracy? These issues of civic trust and capacity to engage with people who are not similar to yourself are key. And so if we have an issue here where tools which enable sharing help people feel more comfortable sharing and discussing things with people different than themselves, that's red letter news. I mean, as policymakers, we really need to look into that to understand how that's going to affect our populations. Uh, but you asked a second question. 
uh, on the Chinese example. I think conflating Facebook users across China and Estonia would probably be a tough sell. In the linguistic issue there, as I've seen the data, there are vastly more Chinese users deal using other social media tools than Facebook. The, the comparative adoption rates between the tools there are, are disparate, so I wouldn't want to conflate tools. Uh, but I think we're going to have some great research coming out on the behavior side there, looking at that shortly. Um, do you want to go ahead? I think or? we actually have some folks studying the yep. China context, right? Who would like, maybe could You'd weigh in. Could we get a microphone here? Do we have a microphone? <clears throat> yeah, we just uh, uh, very much agree that, uh, that, that uh, professor's uh, comment. And uh, that's... Uh, can you identify yourself for me? Okay, uh, I'm uh, Lei Zhen from Fudan University. And uh, actually, in the last uh, one year, we are studying uh, social media in China, uh, how government in China using social media to communicate with citizens. And uh, awesome. particularly, we look at uh, a Chinese version of, uh, of Twitter. And because mm -hmm. Twitter and Facebook are actually blocked by Chinese government. But it doesn't mean that Chinese people don't have social media. Uh, for example, we have, uh, in this uh, past year, there was a social phenomenon in China we call the Weibo phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Weibo is a Chinese uh, t uh, Twitter. And it's uh, uh, like uh, users reach, uh, reach 200 million in just one year. And the whole, uh, the, the, the whole country, everybody is using their like, uh, smartphone, uh, 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 yeah. uh, uh, criticizing government, uh, talk about public issues with, uh, with Weibo. So if you only look at uh, Twitter, how many uh, Twitter users in China, uh, it, that's not a, a good methodology. But if you, you need to look at Chinese social, the, 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 um, the Chinese social media, like a face, uh, we have a Chinese version of so, so, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, or all those like Zhen Ren, uh, no. uh, QQ Zong is very popular. And uh, Weibo is also. Yeah, I yeah, really yeah, wonder yeah, about the, the, the perspective. I mean, we're talking about developing countries that don't already have any government engagement platform. Why would we recommend that you go build your own tool and try to get people who are already somewhere else networking quite effectively to come over to you? Why do you not go to where the people are and engage with them? So I think it, that's, that's exactly a, our, uh, our recommendation to the Chinese government. So, because. Uh, 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 the, the, the 200 million, like uh, the Weibo, the, the Twitter, has been very popular. And uh, I think just half a year ago, I received a phone call from Beijing, from uh, uh, Shane, from okay, SIC. Okay. And he asked me uh, an opinion about uh, the Weibo, because some governments are talking about uh, they also want to use the Weibo, the, 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 the Chinese Twitter. Awesome. And, but some Chinese government agencies have a very interesting idea. He said, uh, why not we open our own platform on our website? <laughs> so I said, wow, that's totally against the social media idea. If you, you have your uh, 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 the, the platform, the, 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 the Weibo platform, then people don't come because they already have a community there with 200 million people. So you should join that bigger community rather than yeah. create your own, own uh, uh, community. That's like uh, build your own website. Uh, so so that, that, that's the idea we, we, we talk about. One of the things that I find yeah. intriguing about this question is the notion of uh, why we, when we have governments building e-government portals, I, I'm, I'm not hearing people say, I'm from country X and I'm really losing confidence in my government because they don't have an e-government portal from me, for me. And well, I'm from country Y and we do have an e-government portal so I, I feel great and I have trust. Uh -huh. But when we have governments which are willing and interested in engaging, uh -huh. yeah. that's the key point. And so for a government that wants to solve that problem, uh -huh. what's the better tool to use? Building an e-government portal? or using pre-existing social networking tools to engage with and people. And I would suggest as the later one, just to join a social media uh, platform, to, to open an account on Weibo, on, on this 200 million platform, yeah. rather than building your own portal uh, or your own application, whether it's your own Chinese uh, government version of Facebook yeah. or Twitter. So that's yeah, if, uh, uh, if you're a developing country and you have high Facebook uptake among your population and limited resources, you know, from the glass half, glass half full perspective, instead of sitting around and complaining about how low penetration is, why don't you use the penetration you have to maximal effectiveness? Anyway, we've got at least two questions, and Yana is probably sharpening her axe from my <laughs> head. So let's... Uh, um, uh, since we're talking about the, the, uh, around the background of the Arab Spring, yes. um, among, among the parameters that you used in, in your slides, they are all extremely good except that one parameter is missing, specifically the age group of the users of, of the Facebook. This yeah. is one aspect of it. And the second aspect, particularly in the case of Syria, there is a, a large use by the 
government uh, against the users of on Facebook? And is there a way of finding out first the age group of the users and differentiate between the sort of, let's say, social activists as opposed to people who are driven by the governments to uh, derail whatever is happening? Uh, so the first answer is yes. Teresa will probably not believe this, but I actually cut those slides to save time, having taken now almost double my time. <laughs> but that data does exist. Uh, it roughly maps to the demographic trends already seen. We have very high uptake among the youth, typically lower uptake among, the, uh, among people older than 35. Uh, I think, the, again, the glass half full message there is it's a great way to engage with the people who are most likely to be politically active and uh, influenceable. Um, if you'd like, I'd be happy to send that research to you. It's certainly there. Um, in terms of governments using social media for nefarious purposes, I think the broader question goes back to what kind of government are we dealing with? Is this a government that wants to have positive interaction with its people? If so, this is a, a great tool to do that. Um, I, I don't, we shouldn't have the tool driving the discourse. The discourse here needs to be about engaged, human rights-oriented government. And it, this is a great tool for that. Uh, it can also have, be very effective for less pleasant purposes. You had one more question? I'm really eager mind. to hear what your question is. <laughs> Please. Yeah, you. <laughs> you're uh, running out of time but no my question is um, maybe it's a bit crazy but I think it's important <coughs> I, I heard in the context of Egypt and other other uh, places that when the governments closed down the networks there was an incipient and a, and a fast developing hacker community that started developing alternative social media tools using alternative channels which they I, I don't understand how they did it because uh -huh. I'm not in that but how, how important do you think that is? Do you have any evidence for that? Because I think that's quite interesting in relation to a much more bottom-up models. You know, these tools, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, they're basically all tools provided mm -hmm. uh, and which people can come and use. Fine, you know. But there seems to me uh, also some developments happening which people are, in, in the face of restrictions, starting to develop their own tools. And I wonder if you have any evidence for that. Uh, there is some good uh, data to look at. We could probably have a, a whole session on just that, but I believe one of the specific implementations that would fit the case you're raising is when uh, phone lines were made available for people to be able to call in and have their message transcribed as a tweet that would then be broadcasted. Google was active in trying to implement that. Uh, when we look at the timeline of when those sort of tools were deployed and what the Twitter hashtag trends were at the time and overlay that on how many people were showing up where doing what, I don't see a correlation. I really don't think that at that stage of what was happening that Twitter was uh, relevant on the mass level. You know, at that point we were already talking about millions of people taking action. Uh, you know, I was int intrigued with what people was uh, displaying earlier about how when people are using the internet for a primary news source as a baseline, their views change differently. But I think you know, once the tires have started burning, how much is that kind of Twitter hacktivism helping? I think that's a tough sell. So we hopefully we'll be able to get back to some more discussion um, as quickly as possible. Uh, but we also, uh, in this conversation today, want to um, thank you. I'm so nervous. Let's make sure that there. Mm. Want to have uh, as part of the conversation. Uh, I think the points uh, that that Matt rightly raised in his final conclusions. Um, the, the conversation that's also occurring about social media as a service delivery platform. And so we have, through um, the kind of use that we're seeing throughout the world uh, in terms of social media, we're, we're having increasing questions within, within government um, about how to reach that community of citizens who is, in fact, uh, all over the world um, spending time uh, on these tools. How do we reach them to deliver um, core 
core government services. And I think that, you know, we've seen lots of these, uh, um, uh, the numbers, you know, every social media presentation anymore has to, to spend a little bit of time on the numbers, uh, talking about things um, like Facebook and awareness uh, of how 100% uh, um, awareness uh, of Facebook as an example. And I think this, you know, uh, maps back to the other conversation that was was uh, was happening earlier about the actual tools um, and how do we understand uh, what are the tools that are being used um, around the world in the different regions of the world? Uh, what does that tell us? Um, I think it tells us some interesting things uh, about um, about penetration of specific tools, but it also tells us pretty quickly who's talking with whom and, and, and who is not uh, talking across uh, the boundaries of government or of, of country borders. Um, you know, this is a kind of an insular conversations happening in, in some of these places on these country specific tools. Um, so, you know, it holds, raises a whole new level of, of, of research potentially for those of you in the room like, like me who are very interested um, in the creation of, of inter interoperable system. So how might we begin uh, to think about uh, connecting up some of these networks? But I think this, this diagram tells a really important picture uh, in my mind uh, in terms of, uh, of the sort of the practical realities of, of, of take up of different kinds of tools. These are some numbers that actually respond back to some of the things that were asked earlier about, you know, so who, what do we know about those numbers? 200 million people, 677 million people. Well, what do we know about those, those numbers in particular? Can we, can we learn something from them in terms of the age, uh, the ages or the, or the profile of these users? And I think this is an interesting thing when we're talking about the social engagement process, certainly. Who's out there? expressing opinions, and that's a really very, very critical part of the conversation. But it's also a very critical part of the conversation when we think about social media potentially as a service delivery platform. And so in particular, I like the number 96% of the U.S. millennials have joined a social network site. One of the projects that came to my attention in the state of New York was a project, and it in fact frames some of our conversation today about the use of social media in terms of delivering services to, to citizens, is that, um, so with a, with a number like that, 96% of the U.S. millennials have joined a social network site. It's a good number. The challenge we have inside many of our government agencies is figuring out what to do with that number. So I was approached by the Office of Children and Family Services in the state of New York, who has a program focused on youth at risk. And they began to understand that if they want to engage these young people, make sure that they take advantage of the services that are available through the Office of Children and Family Services, that they need to connect with them in a non-traditional way. Well, non-traditional to whom? Non-traditional to the agency, uh, public, the public workers in the, in the agency, but not non-traditional to those individuals who fall into the category of youth at risk. And so that agency, that team began to figure out, okay, so how do we reach out to these people? How do we engage them? And they began to work in their government agency and realize that there was no policy framework within which they could put some of their programs and services on a social media platform. They did not have the legal authority to enter into an agreement as, a, as an individual government employee. So they couldn't check the box that says, I agree to the terms and conditions on behalf of my agency to live up to these terms and conditions. So what did they do? They did it at home. So they began to set up services using social media sites outside the legal platform that would be provided or the legal, uh, the foundation that, that would be possible um, if in fact their agency had a set of policies and procedures for the use of social media as a service delivery platform. 
And we as an organization at CTG began to understand there are two parts of this conversation, at least, in terms of social media and how we engage uh, or leverage uh, the potential of social media uh, to make a difference. Certainly there's the conversations that we're all having, as Matt um, um, pointed out, the engagement, the awareness, um, the community building, um, the revolution, if you will. But there's also potentially a revolution in service delivery, but we have to think about it in a different way. So again, these kind of changing behavior patterns need to be taken into account. So just as I, you know, I, I intend, end up using a few stories from my own perspective, just as I began to learn how to text with my daughter, she now says, oh, no, Mom, I don't text anymore. I, mess I Facebook message. I'm like, oh, okay. So, <laughs> okay, so, so no, no, no. I, don't, I, I said, oh, did you text Nicole today, right? She's a new college freshman, so she's keeping up with her friends. Did you text Nicole? Oh, no, we don't text anymore. We Facebook message. Ah. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, I, 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 I didn't talk to her for a week. Her behavior's changed. So, but this is a good thing. This is an exciting thing. The challenge as government managers around the world is how do we, how do we take into account these rapidly changing behavior patterns uh, among the communities of people that we're trying to serve with programs that change slowly. They're service programs taking advantage of the services that government has to offer. Um, and so we have to take that into account. The kind of growth, of course, um, we've talked lots about, and, and that just, I think, um, does two things. It raises even more significantly the opportunity that we have, but it also, I think, um, uh, increases the imperative that we figure this out and we put policies and procedures in place um, inside of government to make sure that we can leverage um, leverage this potential. So, you know, using another example, or, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, citizen preferences, we look at all this take-up data. 100 million people, 40 million people, 600 million people. But what we also have are some trends in, in uh, preferences. Social media, do we have a pointer here? Oh, ah, wrong one. <laughs> okay, social media, this is so cool. I'm going to set up a profile and see who else is connected. I can even update my status from my cell phone. I am like so connected. Right? I'm on Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, LinkedIn. This is really cool and I have a lot of connected friends. Okay, then we, you know, sort of the beginning into the trough of disillusionment for those of you who know this, right? Okay, like there isn't one app that can update all the social media sites. I'm going to start deleting my friends that I don't want to stay in contact with and that don't answer my tweets. I don't need to be on all the social media sites. I think I'll stick to Twitter and delete the others. So the preferences are starting to play out. We're beginning to make choices. Twitter is cool, but I don't want people knowing what I'm doing all the time. Well, this is also about how we used to use Twitter when Twitter first came out. Right? And do you have, when was the last time you saw a person send a, uh, a tweet that said, stepped across the room, <laughs> going for coffee? We don't do that. It have, people don't use it like that anymore, do they? Do they? <laughs> Does anybody in here use it? Apologize. <laughs> but, but we're sort of developing our usage patterns, the way we think about and use um, these tools. I have um, my son graduated from college. Um, about three or four months after he graduated from college and he had about 900 friends on Facebook because, you know, everybody you meet at a party, friends you, blah, blah, blah. He said, Mom, I'm going to start deleting friends. I said, do you think that's okay? I, I said, you know, what happens when people delete friends? I said, I, I don't know. This is new territory for me. <laughs> He's asking me, right? He deleted about 300 people who were, had friended him and he had accepted and I'm sure people were doing the same, but he got to the point in his personal experience that he began to understand, and, okay, all right, enough's enough. This is really about who I want to be in contact with and as a college student, the more the merrier. As a young professional, he had a very different perspective and he said, I don't want to clutter my life with all of these friends. I want to unclutter my life. I want to focus on the relationships that matter to me. And I hope these people aren't offended as I defriend them. 
But defriending was a very serious process for him. He had to think about it. What did it mean? What might the impact be? So that kind of takes us back into this kind of social space. But as we begin to think about social media and the transitions that we're seeing uh, in our own use and our own understanding and the use of those around us, um, we see it you, being used in very specific ways by different kinds of communities. Um, the civil society, using it, of course, to influence government actions and politics, policies. We, we've seen that a lot. Uh, used by government figures, as Matt said, as a, as a, as a, um, as a new channel um, for the PR office, for the PIO, the public information officer. Right? So the question is, okay, did you print out the press release? Did you email the press office? Did you tweet? Okay, yep. Check, check, check. We're also seeing governments, in, in more like my friend at the Office of Children and Family Services, to actually communicate um, to governments, or to citizens, um, to engage with them. So not the political leaders, but government managers who are saying, asking for feedback about programs and services. So there's the, you know, there's the use of, the, of, the, of government figures. We know a lot about that. But there's also the use of government managers. A thing, a criteria for success in many of the e-government or e-governance award programs that I see around the world for programs that are put in place by government managers is how are you communicating with citizens to get feedback on your program? This is not what do you think about my politics, what do you think about my platform, it's what do you think about my service? Did I do a good job issuing you a license? So we're starting to see government managers think about social media and how they engage this way. And now they're beginning to think, how do I use it to deliver a very concrete service? So one of my, my last slides before I hand, um, hand the, the podium to Yana is, is um, some of the trends in, you know, I have to bring it back to, to a US experience, where we see on the left here, as of July 2010, we identified that 22 of 24 major federal agencies had a presence on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. I'm usually a fan of saying things like, OK, so what? <laughs> right? So they have a presence. Okay? I have a presence too, but I'm not actually doing anything. Right? But then we also look at things like uh, back in, in, um, in 2010, NASIO, the, Na uh, the, the National Association of State Chief Information Officers in the U.S. did a quick study of CIOs, and they asked them to characterize the current status or implementation of social media initiatives in your state. 23.3 of them were full speed ahead. 48 were proceed with caution. Proceed with caution. So what do you think they're being cautious about? That's actually a question. <laughs> what do you think they're being cautious about in the states? In other, are other governments being cautious about implementing social, you know, the implementation of social media initiatives? Why are they being cautious? Anybody? Okay, so they're they're not sure if what they're going to do what they're considering doing is, is problematic. Right, so is there a quality, what are the new criteria for quality control? Right? Do most government agencies have in place quality control criteria for outreach over social media platforms, for delivery of service over social media platforms? I would imagine not. This is new territory. How much? <laughs> No, 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 social media is free. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's the, what is the TCO of a social media-based government service delivery program? Does anybody know the answer to this question? It's a very exciting problem to have, to think about how do we actually change a service delivery strategy when we think about social media. What are the questions that we have to ask? And a lot of what you're going to hear about from Yana when I get off are what are the policy questions that have to be answered? What are the policy elements that need to be addressed 
um, before a government agency, my friend Joel, can say, you know what, we're going to put in place an office, a, a, a youth at risk program um, for our agency that is not actually run out of my house. It's actually going to be an official service provided by the, the agency. It's, it's, uh, it's not that easy to do, it turns out. So I just want to add, before I step down, um, a set of recommendations that I think are very useful here, as we are all extremely euphoric, I think, optimistic about, about the potential here, about the opportunities. Um, but based on um, the conversations that happened at a workshop that I participated in, um, in Geneva in the spring, there was a set of recommendations that were put on the table by, by that group, and I, and I think they're useful here. Um, and one of them is, frankly, um, uh, pay attention to what we've already learned. When we move into the service delivery environment uh, from a social media platform, we need to understand how the lessons that we've learned over the years are relevant in this context, because many of them are. We cannot throw them all out. We need to adapt them in this context and see which ones can, in fact, um, help us leapfrog uh, into a new um, service delivery opportunity. The second one was uh, actually a recommendation that came from uh, the, the, uh, the presentation of the Bahrain experience where, in fact, um, there was interest in social media as a platform for connecting officials to citizens, and the proposal was to uh, actually, you know, put, put a top minister in front of a, uh, of a, of a device and encourage them uh, to start engaging with citizens. And uh, no, no surprise, the, the whole cabinet said, um, well, in the U.S. they would have said, are you crazy? Uh, I don't know what the uh, comparable phrase is um, in Bahrain, um, but needless to say, they didn't do it. But one person did, and one person did it with a lot of help and a lot of support, and pretty soon everybody was doing it. Right. So they started small, they created comfort, and then they moved forward. And I think this is going to be the same kind of a strategy when we think about service delivery in programs that make sense, like youth at risk. But what about using a social media platform to deliver um, uh, uh, application services for, um, for the elderly? Don't forget the digital divide still exists. I think Matt talks about, talked about the engagement, uh, potentially, of, of the elites uh, in conversations. But there, we also have to think about the non-elites, and I'm sure that Matt was, was thinking of those folks as well. How do we make sure that we're reaching out in all places? And finally, um, this, as, as we think about um, Gov2.0 um, as a technological trend, um, which opens up this kind of um, new, new kind of e-governance for us. We need to think about how, uh, how to create this space um, that's appropriate for an information society. So the challenge is we have sort of mainstream, long-standing government service delivery processes. We have a new technology opportunity um, that can change those. Um, and we need to think about uh, how to, how to put these things together in a way that catapults us to an information society, doesn't keep us in this very in sort of industrial engineering kind of a space when we think about um, service delivery, which is uh, an imp really sort of the foundation of government services is in, our government is in terms of the services we deliver, and that the services we deliver are based, I think, on the way that, that citizens can inform us um, uh, about what they want and, and how they want us um, to deliver those services. So um, for my part, I want to um, introduce Jana Herdnova, who uh, is a member, as you know, of the Center for Technology and Government staff and who was uh, the project lead on CTG's exploratory social media project. Hello, uh, everybody, and thank you for coming to the session. Uh, a quick disclosure, I was supposed to have 85 minutes, I now have 50, so <laughs> I'm obviously going to run out of time, but I'm going to try to go through my slides as quickly as possible, and at the same time, hopefully, uh, allow you time to ask questions. Um, so we started this project in the summer of 2009. Uh, it lasted about two years, but uh, as some of you know in the room, projects in CTG never die. It is still alive and still going. Uh, it consisted of uh, several workshops with government officials from New York State, uh, as well as local and federal governments uh, around the United States. 
Uh, and we all know only collect the data in the United States. You know, this is a quick disclosure. Uh, in the United States, uh, as Teresa has shown on a previous slide, governments have been active in social media quite a bit. And therefore, we were interested in how do they see social media, what do they see the benefits to be, and also, you know, what are the, the barriers to them using social media? So because even though the percentages are quite high, there's still a lot of local um, and uh, government, state government agencies who are very reluctant uh, to jump in. Um. And then we also asked them about the overall strategy and planning. Uh, and then uh, based on a question that we sent out, which was asking for policies uh, of government agencies that, are, that were existing, uh, and, you know, I sent it out to my network, which is fairly big, and uh, I got probably 10 emails back saying, we don't have a policy, but we really want one. So when you're done with all you're doing, uh, you know, please send it to us so we can actually create a policy. Because as many uh, people have uh, mentioned, for government, you know, governments are bureaucracies. There is no way to get around it. So for them to just jump in without any type of framework or policy structure, it is very scary, especially, you know, for the lowly uh, government uh, manager who can get uh, canned any time uh, if, his, if his boss decides that he doesn't like him anymore. Um, so these were the perceptions that we collected uh, from the field uh, in the United States, uh, the benefits of using social media. Uh, obviously, you know, reaching new audiences, you know, the, the need to reach out to the youth, uh, you know, was seen as a huge benefit, the potential uh, to connect with those uh, people who normally don't really want to communicate with government that much because government isn't cool. Uh, you also have more control. Um, you know, we talked to some of the local uh, government agencies and they said, you know, when the Times Union, which is the local paper in Albany, writes about me, it's never good. It's always, you know, the most embarrassing possible story. Facebook and Twitter gives me an opportunity to present the good side of what I'm doing, and that is very important to them as well. Uh, it also has the potential to enhance your collaboration with your stakeholders um, and also reducing routine questions uh, from the general public, uh, which cuts down on your cost of providing these services. Uh, they also felt that it would improve public perception of them, you know, that we are cool and, you know, we are advanced and we are using what you are using, which um, I don't know if, you know, uh, how many of you know, but in the United States, that is not the perception of government. Uh, government is seen as the backward, um, the backward elephant in the room sometimes. And also cost savings. Uh, as many of you know and have experience in your own countries, we are going through financial crisis right now. And uh, state uh, government uh, are very, very p uh, much affected by this. So they are looking for ways to still get their message out, but at the same time uh, cut on the cost of doing so. Uh, when we mapped it uh, against the research or uh, against the survey by, done by NASIO, uh, you know, it, it mapped up very, very nicely. As you can see, citizen engagement uh, was one of the, you know, most important uh, reasons why state governments uh, have gone on, uh, on social media, uh, as well as public information and outreach, uh, as well as business engagement and government engagement with other, uh, with other agencies. At the same time, uh, we also know, and you know, this, these uh, statistics, statistics have been already mentioned in the, in the morning session, that you know, we have this perception of uh, citizens wanting to engage with us. And if we are on social media and Facebook, we are going to be connected. But when you actually look at what citizens are doing in terms of social media uh, in, in regards to government, uh, the, t the statistics are quite, uh, quite different. Now, granted, you know, these data was collected in 2009, so it's quite outdated. It has probably changed. But as of April 2010, 46% of citizens felt that it was a good thing for governments to try to reach out to them via social media, while 40% of people agreed it was a waste of money. So again, you know, governments are kind of torn because on one hand, they want to engage, but at the same time, they're also getting a message, or th they actually don't know what the message is from the citizen. Uh, and are wondering whether they are going to see us wasting money, uh, which uh, in the United States uh, is always a death toll for a politician. Uh, but what we do know is that there are some actual benefits. Uh, obviously, if you post a video on YouTube, you do not have to uh, provide the bandwidth uh, to stream it. Uh, you also have the new searching behaviors of, of people, which allows them to reach out to you in different ways. 
uh, and you can also express your content in different ways. So you no longer have to go you know, to your IT guy who knows HTML and can put it on your website. You can just do it yourself. It allows you uh, to communicate with citizens in a more direct way. Uh, also, the communities are already created. That was already mentioned. You know, the people are already there, right? You are at the mall, as one of the people um, that we have talked to said. You know, people don't have to find you at the store anymore. You're at the mall. They know where you are, and, and they can get to you. And again, you know, one of the most uh, important benefits that people have also mentioned is that it provides additional channel to get people to get, uh, go to your website. You know, Facebook and Twitter aren't equipped uh, to be able, you know, to be able to, for government, uh, express policies and very difficult topics that require a lot of text. That is your website. You know, Facebook isn't going to replace the website, but Facebook does allow you to let people know about new policies or new services and then drive them to your website, uh, which is ultimately the goal. We also ask about barriers, um, and you know there were many, uh, and I don't know if I'm going to read them all, but some of them were you know governance of social media engagement. You know people are very afraid that if they jump in, you know jump on the bandwagon, their uh, employees are going to go rogue on them and start posting things that they shouldn't. It was a very big concern of many many government agencies. Uh, also, the legal uh, uh, ramifications. Uh, you know, again, uh, Theresa mentioned the problem is the terms and conditions in the United States. That is a that was a huge problem. It is it is still a problem, but it is getting slowly better. Uh, they were also uh, nervous about you know the negative perception. If I do engage as my citizens and they post negative comments on my official Facebook page, what is it going to do? Is it going to make me look bad? And how do I how do I deal with that? Uh, security was, of course, uh, quite a bit uh, of a concern. Uh, lack of organizational resources. You know, Teresa said uh, facetiously, uh, social media is free. It is not free. Uh, it is not free. There is a cost associated with it, uh, you know, depending on the tool. For instance, if you want to do YouTube videos, you have to have the camera. You have to know how to edit videos. You have to have staff that is comfortable in front of a camera. Uh, and it also takes time. You know, it's, uh, it's not... Um, extremely burdensome, but it's not free either, and you should recognize that as well. Uh, they were also afraid of information overload. There is so much information out there. You know, if I throw more stuff out there, are they just going to shut me down completely and not listen to me at all? Uh, and the other thing that they were worried about quite a bit is, you know, how do I convince my boss to do this? You know, it's not easy. They are very worried. They're usually elected. So they have a bigger stake in terms of presenting uh, their agencies uh, in a certain, certain light. Um, so there was, those were the concerns um, that, we, that we have heard about. Now, I wanted to do you know, a small group discussion, but I don't think I'm going to have time. So I'm just going to ask you, uh, as a group, you know, these two questions. Uh, in your countries, I would love to hear you know, what are the benefits that you think your government agencies see from using social media, and also what are the barriers? Um, what are those? What are the benefits and what are the challenges that your governments in your countries are facing? Anybody? Luis? Well, I, I was in a, actually in a workshop where there were many, many, many people from government in Mexico. And uh, they, they were, actually they were looking, even though you, you, you just said that social media is not free, if you have zero infrastructure, then well, it is, it is much more attractive yes. because, because they saw a free infrastructure where they could do some, some work. And I think that the, the most common uh, barrier that they were sharing were that they were a little scared in part about this, how to manage this bad uh, feedback or negative feedback how to defriend these citizens that are not good to them, <laughs> and, uh, and also <laughs> the they met at a party. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and also overload because many of them have memories about email. So they said, "Well, email was very good, but then one day I had 126 emails in my inbox asking me things." So they were concerned about how to manage that 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 workload.
Okay, once again, I'm Sergio Campo, and I do not represent the Ministry of Justice of Finland, but I do work for them. I'm a free agent uh, <laughs> because I'm also a researcher at the Sudentern University in Sweden. So I uh, skip around, and I'm an outsider. I'm not from Finland, nor from Sweden. Um, in any case, uh, I was, uh, the Finland had um, parliamentary elections uh, just a couple of months ago in the spring. And for that purpose, um, the unit where I work or I am engaged with has had in charge all the dissemination of information for the elections and so on and so forth. And I come up with the idea that whether we're going to have uh, Facebook or not, because I've been following the processes in the United States and elsewhere, so I'm very interested to see whether that is possible to try out in Finland. And uh, then my... Um, and someone asked me then, well, what does that imply? So I said, well, you, you know, you just uh, we open up a thing and say, hi, come and vote this in this date. And we're very encouraged the people to say this. Oh, just a second. Is that about information? So the information department has to look at this and because it goes like this and like that. Or, um, yeah, but I said, well, yeah, but uh, maybe a video. Ah, oh, but that's IT. Or do we have to talk to the people from IT? So now what I'm, what I'm saying is that there were, there were two things. Yes, there is a lot of interest. And uh, at the end of the day, they did it, not under the ideas that I had. Well, OK, so someone took over, and, and they are more knowledgeable than myself. But, uh, but um, the, the, although the interest there is, the problem of a place like the Ministry of Justice is information, how accurate the information comes out. The, the official working for Facebook or whatever social media you have has to be very clear as to what he or she is allowed to say and in what way because, because it is in the representation of the ministry. And, I'm, uh, and I insist I'm not the ministry, I'm not from the ministry. And the second thing is that um, uh, by doing that, it, when you have an, a very heavy bureaucratic apparatus, then you cannot engage in the same way as social media does, fast and quick. You deliver very slowly. And although you could believe that you could throw away everything else, just say, come and vote, that implies a series of other things because mm -hmm. there is a, a problem of communication, etc. So there you have... a a real problem <laughs> to engage with social media, although there is a lot of interest. And, the, and I'm working with a very dynamic group. Yeah, so, so, yeah, I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying that it's a very, very difficult engagement. Thank you. I think even um, a gentleman there. Thank you very much. I'm Ibrahim from United Arab Emirates. Um, I think on the benefit side, it's almost the same other countries, especially considering the high penetration of social media and cell phones in UAE. But on the barrier sides, uh, or the obstacles, I guess um, there are organizational and then cultural uh, obstacles. On the organizational side, um, I think the biggest challenge is how to adjust um, the way government agencies used to communicate in a vertical, rigid way to fit the horizontal way of communication in social media. Mm -hmm. Um, how to be able to understand the pattern of discussion, analyze them in social media, and then get um, a useful feedback, and then get this feedback into the um, processes of service design and decision making mm -hmm. within the government. And then there is a cultural barrier, especially at the top level uh, management within mm -hmm. the government agencies. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, all, all the comments that we have heard, you know, have to do a lot of uh, management of social media engagement. And we actually have a day-long class uh, on this at CTG, so I can present all of it. But, you know, the content I issues and the citizen engagement, what do you do with it once you get the comments back? Uh, those are very common. And, um, you know, while we always advise them to make a plan, it's, it sometimes can be difficult. Um, yes? I'm sorry, uh, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Uh, yes, uh, one of the first sort of, I'm not sure if it's even a government level, but one of the state level large campaigns using the social media was when President Obama was elected yes. for the president and there was quite, uh, quite extensive aftermath done on different uh, surveys and different um, 
papers presented, how it was used and what was trusted and what was not. And if you look at those tables, then you see that uh, one of the less trusted media, actually, on those campaigns were blogs and the social media as, as such. That was, of course, several years ago. And um, being worked for one of the largest IT companies as well, uh, at some point of my life, I know that the social media is very often, both on the governmental and on the corporate level, is basically used as an advertising tool, yes. imagining that nobody will understand that this guy is getting paid for blogging. So right. uh, my question is, uh, has it changed in the past couple of years? Or uh, if we actually talk about the social media on the... Uh, governmental level, are we talking about public servants doing it or are we talking about a government agencies doing it? Right. Uh, that is a very good question. And, you know, the way I always talk about it is we don't do campaigning. CDG is not about talking to politicians and helping them, you know, create their social media strategy for a campaign. We are talking about government agencies using social media. So some of the, some of the concerns about, you know, propaganda um, are not necessarily mute, but a little less, because obviously if I read uh, a blog of a politician that I, I strongly distrust, I'm simply not going to trust the information, no matter what form it is in. I mean, it's not just blogs, it's also printed media. Um, so um, I think w what, what we studied was just government using social media for information and service purposes. Yeah, can um, I jump into this? Yes, yeah. absolutely. No, this is, I, I think this is one of the problems, whoa, that we have <laughs> in this conversation um, still is that, you know, when we talk about the Obama campaign, when Obama was campaigning, it wasn't government. Right. It was the Democratic Party that was using social media to get Obama into office. And so it wasn't government use. And this is where it gets confounded, I think, in a lot of our conversations, is we have to understand, are we talking about government individuals who are seeking government office and therefore using the platform to, to put forward a position? Are we, thi are we using, thinking of the platform as a way to bring communities together to inform government? Are we thinking about using the platform, as Yana says, as a way for government to engage citizens uh, either for feedback or actually as a service delivery uh, interaction? And so I, I think in the early days of the web uh, and e-government, we hadn't sort of created all the nuances of use uh, so that we could plan around them, as Yana talks. But I think we're starting to see more clearly the nuances um, and to be able to talk about the differences in terms of how we uh, use social media. And I think this that's a really good one. How has, so now President Obama, as the, as the president, is using social media to campaign, but he's using it he doesn't call it campaigning, but we all know it is, right? So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out because I think this is one of the things that we have to be really careful about when we're talking about these things. Last comment, yes. And may I add I another clarification? <laughs> the, the fact that um, because it comes up when Obama now is president and so on, we have to split also government from state, Absolutely. okay? Because the government is those people who have been elected to be the head of the, of the state or whatever you have, and then the state is the apparatus that stays there and, gives, and offers services and so on and so forth. And most likely, they have, uh, there are officials who are, who are paid to stay there and they have a career within the, 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 the state uh, apparatus. But Obama is president and politician. Yes. And that's, that's here very, very important, right. these, the, all these distinctions yes. and, and the deliveries of services and, and so on. You know, and if you actually look at President Obama's use of social media, he does have a dual track. He has one track for him as a campaigner, as a politician, and then a second track as an executive chief of uh, of the nation. So there is a duality to it uh, because of legal issues. Um, okay, so moving on to why do governments need a social media policy? Uh, as I said, a lot of government agencies are trying to jump into using social media and it is scary for them. Uh, it is scary because uh, they are afraid what their employees are going to do, uh, they are afraid what uh, their bosses are going to think of them, uh, they are afraid that they are going to screw up, um, and they are afraid that they are going to lose legitimacy with their public. Um, and social media policy is one way to communicate to, to the employees on how to not let any of this happen or, um, or inform them about how to use it properly if using it uh, as a delivery channel. Now, 
you know, at this entire conference, uh, people have been uh, using the phrase, governments use social media. And uh, in the United States, it's government agencies use social media. Well, government and government agency does not use social media. There is no such thing as, you know, the Department of State, you know, going online and ticking, right? It's the employees um, that use social media on behalf of their agencies. And as we are doing our research, we realized that there was a very important distinction, uh, especially uh, in regards to when you start writing policies. So what we distinguish, distinguished was three different types of use of social media by, by government employees while at work. So there is the agency use, and that is the you know, Department of State Twitter account or Department of State Facebook account. And there is a specific group of employees who are responsible for posting information onto the official agency account on behalf of the agency not representing themselves. Uh, then you also have the professional use uh, of social media while at work. Uh, somebody in previous sessions uh, has, uh, has mentioned Govloop, uh, which is basically a Facebook for government employees in the United States. And that is a very popular platform for government employees to find information about how other people are doing things uh, that they are interested in. So we have, for instance, employees uh, using uh, Govloop or other social media asking questions about acquisitions of IT. You know, how do you get around a problem? And they're not asking, you know, the person next door, but they're asking person uh, in California, and they're sitting uh, in Boston, for instance. So that is the professional use. That is uh, improving the professional to make him do his job better. Uh, and then we also, of course, have the personal use, which is, uh, you know, me going on Facebook during my lunch break, hopefully my lunch break, always my lunch break. <laughs> That's because uh, I'm in the room. <laughs> yes. And uh, updating my profile with uh, information about what my kids did at a soccer game or something. Um, the distinctions are important uh, because the, issue, the boundaries are very, very blurry. Uh, and they are blurry because you can simultaneously engage uh, in professional and personal use as well. You know, the person who goes onto Govloop, for instance, uh, can share information about acquisition, but he can also share his favorite recipe. Uh, so you have this collusion of professional and personal, personal uses, which when you talk to the human resource management people, you know, they're like pulling their hair out because they don't know how to control it anymore. Uh, and you also have a linked up personal and professional identities. I only have one Facebook page. And, you know, if I identify myself as an employee of the Department of State and I say something bad about, oh, I don't know, let's pick Estonia since we are here. If I say <laughs> something bad about Estonia, you know, it might have repercussions for my professional life because I'm no longer just representing myself on my personal account, but I'm also identifying myself as a professional that is connected with the Department of State. Uh, and the same, is, the same goes with the permanency of social media content. You know, it never quite goes away. Uh, you can find information from five years ago, and when you're trying to hire a new professional, uh, uh, you know, you want to check back his records to make sure that there is no embarrassing video of him doing anything illegal, for instance. Um, why that's important is because it, it makes uh, monitoring employee use more difficult. You can no longer block CNN and know that nobody's going to go on CNN. If you block Facebook, nobody will go on Facebook, but that also limits your agency's ability to go on Facebook and engage with citizens. Um, it also is more difficult uh, in coordinating agency message. You know, suddenly you have a room full of people who know how to use Facebook. It is not that difficult. I cannot do websites, but I can do Facebook very easily. Uh, and you also have legal issues, uh, at least in the United States, uh, connected to employees' rights to privacy and, you know, and free speech. Can you really monitor his personal Facebook account um, and punish him for saying something when he's really on his personal time? So as we are talking about this, uh, and as we analyze 26 documents that we have collected in the span of about six months um, from uh, October of 2009 through March of 2010, we started to realize that there's about, there, we, has, we identified eight essential elements that you should think about when you are jumping in as a government agency and that should be in your policy, uh, not necessarily all of them, but you should definitely think about including a uh, majority of them, if not all. Uh, the eight essential elements, it's employee access, how you're going to control your employees and access uh, to social media. 
how are you going to manage your account, account management? How are you going to make sure that there is nobody going to be posting anything embarrassing? You know, how do you make sure that your accounts are protected and nobody has passwords that they shouldn't have? Uh, then you also have the acceptable use, and you know that is the classical. Uh, you know, my government or my my employee is going to go on Facebook and spend four hours chatting with his girlfriend type of a deal. How do you make sure um, that your employees don't waste time doing Facebook? Uh, employee conduct. How do you make sure that your employees, when they are representing your agency on an official social media account, don't do anything embarrassing? How do you make sure that they know what to do and what not to do? Uh, content, you know, uh, that was already brought up. How do you manage your content? How, what are going to be the channels through which your employees can post things on an official uh, social media account or an agency? Uh, security and legal issues uh, are self-explanatory. And then also citizen conduct. How are you going to manage your citizens, right? I, I know it's supposed to be your free and open, uh, but who are we kidding? We have to manage citizens as well because as a government agency, we cannot afford to have inappropriate content on our official sites. So access. Again, access policy delineates who and under what conditions can access social media tools from a government-owned network device. Um, in our report, we don't necessarily tell you what you should do because we believe it's different uh, for every agency depending on your context. You know, for a large agency, uh, you might allow everybody to go on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, for a smaller agency, uh, you know, that means that your people might be wasting time, so you might actually restrict uh, the access. Uh, in general, what we have seen in the United States uh, is that one agency we spoke to had open access without restrictions. Everybody else limited it. Uh, what some of them created was a process for how to get access, so you as an employee could uh, present a business case uh, to your manager that says, you know, I, for my professional reasons, I need to be able to access Twitter or Facebook, and they could get access uh, that way. Other agencies uh, based uh, their access on selecting sites and tools. Uh, for instance, one agency thought that YouTube was a very valuable source uh, of information for their employees. So they let everybody use YouTube, but not all, uh, not, 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 not the other tools. Account management. Uh, account management uh, means the creation, maintenance, and deletion of social media accounts. We had uh, a little bit of an embarrassment of our newly elected new governor who created a Twitter account and they posted the link on the website. Uh, what they didn't know, that the account was not active. Uh, one of our graduate students, not of CTG, but at U Albany, uh, noticed that and created the account on his behalf and started posting things as the governor of New York. Um, and he did it for a couple of days, for like five days. And, you know, fortunately he wasn't uh, too facetious. Um, but eventually people caught on. There was not an official, you know, he was posting information that governor probably wouldn't. And it was on the front page of New York Times. And you don't want that to happen to your agency. Um, so usually uh, what, we, what, we, what we say is you should have a protocol for opening an account. You should have a process by which a program within your agency can come to you and say, we think that having a Facebook um, or YouTube channel would be very beneficial. And this is my business case. You know, this is the reason why I think we should have it. Uh, and there should be an approval process uh, that, you can, that they can go through. Uh, you should also provide guidance on maintenance of logon information of existing account and employees with access. You know, this is the typical... Um, if one of your employees has access and has the logon information and then you fire him, well, if he still maintains that information, he can do some real damage to your social media account. So you want to know who has access to your accounts, and uh, so when they leave, you can change that and protect the integrity uh, of, your, um, of your account. Uh, also, account closing guidance. You know, we see a lot of uh, social media tools uh, or social media sites of governments that haven't been used for months. Um, and, you know, we say if you haven't used it for four months or less uh, or more, uh, maybe just close it and uh, delete it because it doesn't really provide any value. And in some ways, it actually makes you look bad out there. And the same is password guidance. You know, make sure that passwords are protected. Uh, that you know who has them, uh, and then if they leave, all passwords are changed. 
uh, acceptable use policies. Um, again, you know, these are, at least in the United States context, you know, that is very uh, straightforward. Uh, acceptable use policies are in place for use of internet most of the time, of computers, telephones, cars. Um, so those are not necessarily new. Um, but what we have seen um, is, you know, with the increasing popularity of the tools for professional reasons, acceptable use policies don't address that. You know, they say you cannot use it for personal reasons, but there is really no allowance uh, for the professional use. Uh, and that is something that some government agencies are slowly uh, starting to get around and are starting to recognize that they do have to take that into account um, as well. Employee conduct. Employee conduct addresses what is right and what is wrong in terms of employees' behavior uh, when engaging with social media tools or on social media platforms as an employee of a particular agency. Um, you know, again, some of these rules are in existence, right? Your employees should know that they shouldn't swear at citizens. Pretty basic. They shouldn't insult them. Uh, they shouldn't do anything illegal. But again, you know, it, it, it always is good to remind them that those same uh, things apply to social media because social media has this informal, uh, you know, personal feel to it. And uh, employees need to be reminded that if you are representing an agency, you're no longer being uh, representing yourself. You are now speaking on behalf of agency. As an, and as a government agency, you need to uh, maintain some decorum uh, that doesn't include swear words, for instance. Um, you know, again, this is where we uh, encounter the blurry line between personal and professional. Um, uh, you know, to what extent has a government agency right to punish an employee who is posting something inappropriate on their personal uh, Facebook and their personal time? Uh, for instance, recently we had um, a huge union protest in the state of Wisconsin uh, for many reasons. And uh, the Wisconsin uh, paper posted um, something along the lines that the Madison police is going to clear out the protesters from the Capitol. And the Indiana um, Deputy Attorney General posted, use live ammunition, meaning shoot them. Uh, I assume it was a joke. Uh, however, it was extremely inappropriate to do it, uh, especially since he, he was identifiable uh, and people knew his position in government. He lost his job as a result of that. Um, the one thing that you know, we have seen a lot of governments do is that they mandate their employees use disclaimers on their personal <coughs> postings, you know, s things such as, you know, as the gentleman said from Finland, I do not represent the ministry. I'm talking as, a, as an individual. Um, and that is one way to kind of get around, uh, you know, the sticky, you know, professional, personal use uh, and the legal issues connected with that. Content. Content is probably the biggest uh, area that needs to be managed. Um, and what we have seen uh, is different strategies for how uh, how, uh, how government agencies manage their content. Uh, majority of agencies use centralized process for employee posting. In other words, it's usually the public information officer who is tasked uh, with maintaining a social media account, meaning that he is the one who is going to post everything. Now, that goes against the spirit of social media. Um, you know, social media should be social. You know, you should have an informal, immediate uh, relationship with your citizens. Uh, but I think that is still, you know, a cultural struggle for a lot of governments because they're not used to that and they are, quite frankly, afraid of that. Um, you know, content policy doesn't have to set a detailed protocol for the whole agency. For instance, uh, if you are speaking about a United States federal agency, you know, that has, you know, some of them have 20 huge departments. But what you should do is mandate that each program that wants to create a social media account should have some type of a content policy that they should follow. Uh, the other way, uh, the other thing that we have seen in terms of uh, producing content, for instance, NASA. NASA has an incredible social media platform. I mean, they have astronauts, you know, twittering from space and uh, taking pictures from space, and it's really amazing. Uh, so some agencies are much more willing to let their employees engage directly. You know, nobody is checking the astronauts' Twitter. They're just posting it uh, directly. It will take too long to go back and forth. 
Um, and we have seen it, for instance, with the Environmental Protection Agency as well. You know, some agencies and you know, some of their cultures are much more willing to experiment. Uh, we are not going to see it with Department of Defense uh, for obvious reasons. You know, it's, it, it really depends on your context, and you should not underestimate the context of your agency uh, because that's what's going to drive what is okay for you to do. Security, security policy outlines security procedures employees have to follow when using social media tools. Uh, you know, just like email, just like internet, there are things on social media um, that are dangerous for your infrastructure. Um, you know, at, at this day and age, uh, if you get an email that proclaims that you have just won half a billion, uh, you know, dollars from, I don't know, Australia, you're probably not going to click on the link. I mean, there are some people who do, but most people know that it's probably not a good idea to open that link because it's going to affect your computer. Uh, it's a different story when you get a message from your mother saying, hey, I just saw this something, you know, I just saw something very cool, why don't you click on it? And because in social media you have this assumption of trust, right? It's coming from your mother, it's coming from your good friend. You might be more inclined uh, to let your guard down and, and click on things that you probably shouldn't. You know, when we talk uh, to government, uh, to, to the IT people in government agencies, they really said it, it's behavioral more than technical. You know, the, the technical issues are the same. You know, your spamware, your malware protection, all that stuff. It's the em education of your employees and their behaviors, you know, making them aware of what can happen uh, if you are not careful. Um, that, that matters in terms of security. Uh, we, we also haven't really seen many policies that are very concrete of a security protections simply because uh, social media changes so fast. So you see new threats arising, arising almost every day. Uh, but they, there are some basic rules um, that they have been uh, using. Legal issues. Now, again, you know, we only studied the United States context. So legal issues in your country might be completely different. But it, it is something uh, that people see as a huge barrier to their usage of social media. Um, and at least in the United States, the problem is that the policy environment has not really caught up with the technology, right? Technology, and uh, I think it was Tai Wu who has used this in his slide, technology is spinning 10,000 miles an hour. Policies are spinning 10 miles an hour. So you have a huge disconnect uh, with, uh, with policies and the technology. And that sometimes creates uh, legal, le legal barriers. Uh, for instance, in the United States, uh, some of the legal barriers are terms of service, as I have mentioned before. Records management. You know, do I have to keep everything in social media? Uh, in the United States, every agency has to keep every uh, piece of information they produce or get from citizens. Is so does social media fall under that? And if so, how do I, how do I keep it? How do I capture it? Uh, freedom of speech, uh, you know, it's the same, you know, employees talking on their personal accounts and you want to monitor it. Um, and citizen privacy. Uh, we had one agency who wanted to contact people with disabilities through Facebook, except they didn't get permission to do so. So when they tapped somebody, uh, they managed to tap somebody with the same name but without disability. The person who was disabled later found out about it and felt that his privacy was invaded because somebody else, who he doesn't know, but still somebody else with his name found out that somebody else with the same name has disability. Uh, and that was a huge concern uh, for that agency and it was shut down immediately. Uh, lastly, citizen engagement. Uh, and I changed the name of it uh, just an hour ago because I realized it's no longer just citizen conduct. It is citizen engagement. Citizen engagement refers to setting protocols for the appropriate conduct of citizens on an official agency social media site and how will inappropriate conduct be handled, uh, as well as providing directions on who is responsible for monitoring and reviewing citizen input. Um, a lot of the people that we have spoken to uh, felt very worried uh, that if they open up their social media accounts for citizens' comments, uh, they are going to get inappropriate behavior. Uh, you know, people attacking each other, uh, people attacking uh, each other for reasons such as racial issues or sexual issues. Um, and they realized that in order for them to, to maintain the integrity of their social media engagement, they cannot have something like that happening. 
so what some of them have created is rules of conduct. Uh, and you can see them usually posted right on the front page, uh, for instance, of a blog or a Facebook page. And the rules of conduct uh, explain to the citizen what type of comment is going to be accepted and what kind of comment is going to be del uh, deleted. Uh, again, those are very, um, uh, very, very normal rules of conduct. Uh, you know, don't promote illegal activity. Um, you know, don't engage in hate speech. Uh, do not insult uh, anybody because of their race, nationality, uh, or accents, for that matter. Um, and what we have also seen is that some government agencies, what they are doing is when they review the comment, uh, you know, in the spirit of openness, if they see that, for instance, somebody slipped an F word in the middle, uh, which is a swear word, uh, they send them an email back and say, we would really like to post your comment, uh, but you have to remove, you know, a certain portion of it, otherwise we cannot post it anymore. Uh, so that way they kind of get around the censorship issue, which is also uh, a big concern of citizens. Um, and also, you know, if you want engagement, you need to manage the engagement. You cannot just let a comment sit there for, you know, 20 days and not answer it. So you also have to start creating uh, rules uh, that, that mandate who is going to be responsible for monitoring the site, who is going to be responsible for reviewing citizen input and, and responding to their concerns, for instance. Uh, and we have seen various strategies uh, for doing so. You know, some agency uh, posted in their, in their uh, rules that they are only reviewing the site 8 to 5, Mondays through Friday. If I get your comment after that, I am going to post it the next day. Uh, and what that means is that the citizen is not expecting, you know, a post to come on at 2 a.m. Uh, because he knows and he has been informed uh, that it's not going to happen until 8 a.m. when I get to work. Um, creating a policy, getting started. Um, what we have realized a lot of times when we talk to government agencies is that, um, you know, one of those my boss saw that the other city had Facebook, so he wants me to have Facebook too. Um, and that is uh, the wrong way to go around it. Um, you have to have an objective uh, for using social media uh, because your objective is going to drive what you're going to do on it uh, and also creating the policy. Um, social media, uh, as I believe you have mentioned already, uh, is a very multifunctional uh, thing. Uh, when we first uh, started interviewing um, an agency in New York, in New York State uh, and about their policy, you know, or, or about engagement on social media, they said, well, the HR person sent me to the PI person, which is the public information, and the public information officer said, that's not me, that's the IT people. And the IT people sent me to the legal department. So you have this, you know, um, Con confusion in some ways, but also realization that if you want to have an effective policy, you need to bring in a team uh, that includes all these facets because they are going to be all involved uh, in making sure that engagement is appropriate. Uh, you should also look at your existing policies uh, because a lot of your policies are going to um, uh, cover uh, social media tools or some of the aspects of social media tools. Um, and also, as the, the president of Estonia said in his opening talk, um, doing things online uh, mandates that we look at our existing policies and laws and procedures and see if they are consistent or inconsistent with social media engagement. Uh, for instance, um, you know, what we have often seen is that um, the, uh, the policy, the existing policy mandates that all uh, public information is going to be reviewed by the public information officer who is then going to send it you know, to the head of the department, who is then going to send it to somebody else, and then eventually it will trickle back down to you and you can release it. But that is no longer feasible in social media world. You need to react much quickly. Uh, so you need to look at your policies or at your, at your existing procedures and see to what extent uh, they aligned uh, with social media. This is our report. Uh, it's on our website. Uh, it's a 10-page report, very easy to read. Um, it includes uh, examples uh, from different uh, guidelines and social media policies that we have reviewed, and it also includes links to them. Um, like I said, it's freely downloadable. Download, download, download. Um, yes, go ahead. Um, actually, this is um, what 
I know is that some other countries have started to use this uh, document to develop their own policies. And if it does turn out that you do that, we would love to hear about it because we can add your links uh, to, the, to the models, to the examples, so that they're not just looking at U.S. examples, uh, which are, you know, maybe interesting, but maybe not very um, useful or relevant. So if others use this uh, to, to develop their own policies or have feedback on it, let us know and we can add it. Mm -hmm. Um, I was going to show you an example of how DOT has used it, but I'm just going to go through that. Uh, and then I was also going to talk about some of the strategies for thinking about your plan. But we are running out of time, so I'm going to just open it to questions and um, discussion. In other languages as well? No, it is only in English right now. I could translate into Czech, but I'm not so sure it's a good idea. <laughs> Considering my check is going down. We'd, we'd love to maybe, uh, any ideas for how we can, in fact, get it translated would be, yes. would be great. It's, as my, Jana said, it's not yes. that long. but It's not that long, no. It's on purpose. Yes. Mm. Yeah, if you just Google it, this, the title, yeah. you don't have to, yeah, it, it comes up right away. Yeah. Excuse me, I'm from the uh, government of uh, Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, relating to this uh, policy issue, do you consider that it's possible for a government to develop a policy based on uh, social media that is related to private companies, related to other government uh, rules and regulations? Uh, the case of Syria is one, and you can consider others. Can we build our policy based on a, a product or a software that or services, whatever platform, that we don't know when it will be uh, uh, allowed to be used, when it will be rejected, when, there will, when they will be changed their rule, when they will close it, they will, when they will open it, and whether it is required to develop something that is uh, with multiple options, because generally you are using social networks, then at other times you say Facebook. You mm -hmm. consider social network is Facebook, is Twitter, is whatever. But I'm not sure to what extent a government can rely 100% on a platform that uh, has different regulations and the rule, and that is changing. Uh, the internet, for instance, as a platform, nobody can stop it in general. But when it comes to specific application, we witnessed a lot of cases where uh, content is removed, content is re replaced, accounts is closed, open, based on unclear policy. So would you think that a government have further explore the possibilities that is there to use social networks than to look only to this uh, private or software, private companies related platform? If I understand correctly, are you asking me whether um, you think it's a good idea that uh, governments should create their own, uh, own platforms for social media? This is your uh, solution, one solution to it. One solution. I think it should be integrated local and international. Yes. I agree that should be integrated with the international network. Mm -hmm. uh, any policy should have it, its local presence as well or regional, unless you have a, an international governance to right. this platform. Right. You know, I, I think what you're talking about is more about strategy for engagement uh, versus a policy, uh, at least in, in, in my context of a policy. You know, I believe that a policy should be developed. You know, it, you can have an enterprise level policy. But the policy should basically mandate uh, the, the individual departments to create their own policy that is more suited uh, to their context. So, for instance, the example I said, you know, EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency, or NASA for that matter, cannot have the same policy as Department of Defense because their contexts are so different. Um, so, uh, United States doesn't have an, you know, a, an, an enterprise social media policy for, for the federal government. But many state governments have created such policy. Um, and, you know, again, I, I believe that the context of the agency should, should mandate the policies. And I think if you create uh, an enterprise-wide policy, you have to take, to take that into account. Just uh, commenting on the question, I think it's a very important question. Um, we had an experience of developing social media policy guidelines for the government of United Arab Emirates. And we relied a lot on, the, uh, on this, actually, uh, report. Um, it was um, an excellent starting point for us uh, throughout the process and then throughout the process. But one issue led to his question that um, the policy should be technology neutral. This is not a help manual on how to right. um, use Facebook yeah. or Twitter. Yes. 
Yes. Because these tools change very often. Yes. Rather, this is a policy uh, mm -hmm. on a higher level, um, provide guidelines for different government agencies and how to yes. manage their social media presence. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, I, I totally agree. You know, we actually differentiate in the policy between guidelines, which is how to use Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, and then a policy which should be tool neutral because the tools change so quickly. For instance, you know, MySpace, you know, who uses MySpace these days? And that used to be the popular one. You know, now it's Facebook, but you know, who knows what it's going to be tomorrow? So I totally agree that, you know, your guidelines can be tool specific, and that is how you log on and how, how to create a good engagement. But your policy should be tool neutral, absolutely. We take the opportunity to say thank you for you and CTG oh. for the help. Oh, you're, you're welcome. 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 <laughs> okay, you're we welcome. are at 4 o'clock. Are there any other questions? Okay, one more question. I know that this is uh, the social media policy domain in which we were discussing all these things. But a blue moon concept come to me that in my organization as an educational institution with 10,000 students and the external domain, I can also have a social media policy for my own college as a principal of the college. Is it possible? Absolutely. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to jump in on this one because before I um, became an academic, I was an IT manager at a university. Right? And, and acceptable use policies, we've had acceptable use policies uh, as long as I, as I worked in this context from the 80s, right? where it was very important for individual students and, acad and faculty <clears throat> and staff who were granted accounts agreed to use those accounts in an appropriate way. So many of the concepts that underlie the social media policy guidance come from any one of you who might have read, you know, appropriate system management guidance from, you know, when we had mainframes. The principles are still there, and this is why it's so important to look back 20 years. We have to have guidance. Um, it, this doesn't say that we're going to control what people say, right. but we would like to say, have them say it in an appropriate way, mm -hmm. given that it's a public comment. So I think that's the difference, right? We absolutely have to have acceptable use policies in place in our institutions of higher ed, um, because it's, a, it's something we've done uh, when we were on mainframes and, and deck writers and when we punched cards, right? Not that I ever did that. <laughs> right, but I think this is, this is just part of taking what we know and what we've had to create in terms of management frameworks and carrying them forward into a new technology space. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thanks.